Hi, I'm Lil, and today I'm making sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is a German word. It means sour cabbage, and it's a kind of lacto-ferment. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit. All you need to make sauerkraut is cabbage, preferably organic, and some salt, preferably good salt like this one, the Malden sea salt. You need a jar to put the sauerkraut in. Um, I use these airlock jars. They're very useful. Um, they prevent oxygen, air from coming in, but they at the same time let carbon dioxide out of the jar. So again, they're very convenient. I'm not going to use this little one, it's too little. I have um, some airlock jars in my oven being sterilized. Um, a simple way to sterilize your jars is just to pour some boiling water over them carefully and then put them in the oven on about 135 degrees for about 10 or 15 minutes and then they are sterilized. You might also like to use a crock. Traditionally, these were used. Um, it's just a jar, a pottery jar with a little lid. I have um, a crock out in my garage at the moment, fermenting away um, the sour with sauerkraut. Also, you might choose to use a an implement to press down on your cabbage in order to release the juices, the brine as it's called. This is just a rolling pin that I use. I've sterilized the ends of the rolling pin. That's why it's a little wet. Um, but of course your hands are an implement and some people just use their hands. I use a combination of both. Fermentation has been with humans for a long time, um, probably somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 BC fermentation began. Probably it was an accident and probably it was with milk products from camels, goats, uh, sheep and cattle. Since then, we've been fermenting all sorts of things. If you eat yogurt, then you're eating a ferment. If you like sourdough bread, then you're eating a fermented bread. Vinegar, alcohol, chocolate, cheese, many, many things are fermented. Fermenting vegetables is a fantastic way to preserve them. So in the days before fridges, people were fermenting. And if you've ever been to Europe or you have European ancestry, then you you may know about cellars full of ferments. It helped, it helped people get through the winter months when they could not grow vegetables, but they still wanted to eat vegetables. When they harvested, they would ferment their vegetables and they'd have a nice supply all the way through winter. You don't need a fridge when you have a ferment. So it's good for preserving food. It's also good for its nutrients. The nutrients that a ferment like sauerkraut provides are fantastic. Fermenting helps with the absor absorption of those nutrients as well and has been linked to um, the health of our immune system. In our gut, there's lots and lots of bacteria and we need, and we're beginning to understand that we need uh, an abundance of good bacteria in order to digest our food properly um, and in order to be healthy. The process of fermentation enables these nutrients to be produced and in fact some nutrients like B12 are produced when sauerkraut is made so it makes it particularly good for vegetarians because B12 is mostly found in meat products. So if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, uh, do some fermenting and you'll have a nice supply of your B12. It's also good with vitamin C. And in fact, Captain Cook, um, when he first started exploring the Pacific, made sure that he had a big supply of sauerkraut um, so that his sailors and his officers would not get scurvy. So what is lacto-fermentation? 
It sounds funny. It sounds like it might be connected with milk, but it's not at all. It comes from the word lactobacillus or lactic acid producing bacteria. When you buy something, when you buy a vegetable from um, wherever you buy it from, there are microorganisms all over it, molds, yeasts and bacteria. Those organisms are sort of held in check on the living plant. But once you take that plant away, you cut off the head of the cabbage, for example, then all those microorganisms start to take over. That's why we put our veggies in the fridge, because that retards that takeover stage. Lactobacillus or lactic acid bacteria is good bacteria. It's good for our guts. Scientists have found that the more we have in our guts, the better our health. And lactobacillus doesn't need oxygen to live and to produce. Some of the bad bacteria, though, in our gut or on vegetables does or do need oxygen. So what fermentation does is produce a liquid, a brine, and that means that the environment is without oxygen. And so the lactobacillus are free to munch away on all the good that it can find in the vegetables, and it helps to stop the bad bacteria from taking over. If some oxygen does get into, into the sauerkraut or into the ferment, then you'll see some mould growth and often the cabbage will go a bit slimy. So it's a good sign uh, not to eat your cabbage if it's slimy. It means some of the bad bacteria has taken over. So what you want to do is make sure that your cabbage is submerged in the brine. So how do we make that brine? Well, let's get started. Get your cabbage and give it a wash and take off some of the outer leaves. I've already done that. <laughs> some of the outer leaves because you will use these as well. Okay. The next thing to do is to cut your cabbage. Now, I would say I, I like to cut it fairly finely but not too finely. So somewhere in the middle between thick and thin. I think that gives the best results. So I'm going to start cutting this cabbage um, and I'll see you in a moment. Okay, so I have cut my cabbage. As you can see, it's not too far, but not too chunky. The next thing to do is to put your salt on top of the cabbage. Now, how much salt to use? If you use too little, then the bad bacteria um, will be able to get in. But if you use too much, that sort of stops the lactobacillus, the good bacteria, from doing its job as well. So it's been found, and I've done a bit of experimenting, but it's generally been found, and I, I agree with this, that um, one kilo to one tablespoon or a little under one tablespoon of salt. So one kilo of cabbage, um, for that you use about one tablespoon of salt. It's always good to start off with less because then you can add more. So I'm just going to use a little bit, oh, it's a bit hard to see, a little bit under one tablespoon. I have about 1.2 kilos. So I'll probably add a bit more salt, but I could give it a taste and see what I think or see how the cabbage is juicing up. So just sprinkle that. I'm just going to pop this down. Sprinkle your salt over, over your cabbage. Okay. And then you can start massaging in. And at this stage, I like to use my hands. So you could even just sprinkle your salt and walk away for 10 minutes. Um, what will happen then is that the salt begins to naturally draw out the juices um, from the cabbage. So it breaks down the, um, the cells, the plant cells. But I like to sort of get in there straight away and start massaging. 
it can be a little bit of a messy a messy thing to do but that's kind of half the fun as well it really is this easy What you'll find is, before too long, and I'm not sure whether you can see, but I can already see that my cabbage is getting, getting wet. That means that those cell walls are being broken down, that the, the juice is being drawn out. So already the salt is working. I think at this stage, I'm going to just pop a little bit more salt in. I sort of have been doing this long enough to know when I need a bit more salt. So I'm going to put about that much more in, and that should be that should be enough for my 12, um, 1200 or 1.2 kilos. This is actually not all of that cabbage. It's amazing how much cabbage there is in cabbage. Um, sometimes, because this is the biggest bowl I have, I have to sort of uh, put the cabbage into two bowls. But for the purposes of this lesson in making sauerkraut, I'm just going to work with this much cabbage. All right, so what you do is keep doing this for as long as you need to. And what I mean by that is you might decide you've done it for long enough when you see brine, that's what the salt and juice mixture is called, when you see some brine forming at the bottom of the bowl. It's only really ever a little bit, but at that point, what I often do then is transfer the cabbage to the container that it's going to ferment in. So once again, I'm going to pause the video and keep on massaging and then uh, turn it back on when I've got a little more brine. Okay, I've been massaging this maybe for about, well, not even five minutes. And I hope that you can see how, how wet my hands are. So for me, this is the time to um, put the sauerkraut into the jar. There is more work to do um, once we do that. Before I do that, I just want to say that what I'm making today is called naked kraut pure cabbage basically but there are many different kinds of kraut you could add a few caraway seeds and and they have a delicious flavor um, uh, a eastern european recipe that i really like has cabbage um, carrot uh, half an apple um, some grapefruit juice and caraway seeds in it that's really yummy you can make beetroot kraut, you might like to try kimchi, which is um, a kind of lacto-ferment as well, but it requires more than just salting the cabbage. There are other steps in kimchi. There is plenty of information online, of course, if you're interested in experimenting. Okay, so I've brought across my sterilised airlock jar. Of course, I don't have the the rubber bit in it yet because it's been in the oven. Um, it's still a little warm actually, so I hope that's going to be okay. Um, it usually has been in the past. I get impatient, you see. I just want to get the process going because the next part is really, really fun. So what you can do is put your, pop this over here so you can see, put your cabbage into, into your jar. Now, just put a little bit at a time and then again either with your hands or with your implement um, so i'm going to use my, my uh, roller start smashing okay so just keep smashing that cabbage down now the amazing thing is even though you're smashing and applying quite a lot of force once the sauerkraut is ready to eat, you'll notice that 
it has retained its crispness. Now that is the salt at work. The addition of salt helps the production of pectin and that contributes to the retention of the vegetable's crispness. So you keep on doing this. At the moment, I'm not sure whether you can see, the mixture is wet but not very wet. There's not a lot of brine or if any down the bottom. Just keep going because what happens is this magical thing. After a while, and I've noticed it's usually maybe another 10 minutes or so, sometimes a little less, but around 10 minutes, suddenly the cabbage pops and it really starts to juice up. It just goes and you'll find that the juice is coming up over the cabbage when you, when you press on it. So I'm going to stop the video again and keep, keep pressing and return to you once the cabbage has popped. Okay, my cabbage has popped and I'm hoping that you can see when I press that there is juice coming up above the cabbage. It's quite juicy and this is, hasn't taken too long actually, maybe because um, it's a smaller, a smaller container. Okay, once it does pop, I tend to go quite slowly with my pressing. I just like to see all that yummy and healthy brine coming, coming up above the surface of the cabbage. You can use your roller again, like I am now, or you can, let me just pop some more in. You can use the, your fist and that's, that's fun as well. That might do. So you can pop your fist in and I can feel all that brine coming up my fingers. Once it pops, the process doesn't take too long, really. You want the cabbage as compacted as you can get it. All right. This one is looking good. Put a bit more in. I'm probably about two-thirds of the way through that large bowl of cabbage that we started out with. So you can see how much, how much juice comes out of the cabbage and reduces the volume of the, of the hard stuff, so to speak. Now the juice is really going. I think you can see that in there. All the good little bacteria are already starting and having a great time in there. Yum, yum, they're munching away on the sugars. They're producing their lactic acid. They're saying goodbye to all the baddies. And in a month's time, which is the recommended um, length of time that you need to uh, ferment your mix for to get the absolute goodness, in a month's time, all that lactic acid bacteria, the lactobacillus, going into your tummy and getting rid of the baddies in there. What they do is lower the pH. They actually make your stomach environment more acidic, and that is okay because the baddies can't live in an acidic environment. That's really quite juicy. Now, you can see that I'm not near the top of the jar, but I'm inclined to actually leave it there because what happens is in that month of fermenting, the, the bacteria, the lactobacillus, produces carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide gets released and you'll see bubbles. What happens is the CO2 gets released out of these airlock jars and you can see that that's happening because the brine bubbles. 
And so if you have too much, if you're too close to the top, then your brine is going to spill out. And in fact, most of the time when I make when I make a ferment, I do have brine spilling over. And so for that reason, I always put my jars on a tray. I've just got a metal tray and I put them on a tray and I check every couple of days. And usually there is some liquid down the bottom and I just give it a clean. Luckily, even though liquid has been released usually in, in, when I make kraut, there is enough of it. So much is produced. There's enough of it to keep the environment or to keep oxygen out of the environment. So I'm actually going to stop it there. Okay, I've got enough brine. It's magic, isn't it? Enough brine to cover that cabbage. But we need to do two more things to finish. And that is, I'm going to wash my hands. We're going to put what's called a follower into the jar. And that's why I asked you to keep your um, washed cabbage leaves, the excess leaves, like the outside leaves. Make sure there aren't any blemishes on those outside leaves. You want them to be pretty, pretty healthy. And you put them in. You're not going to eat this bit. This is not for eating. It's just covering. You can see once again that liquid is really rising up. It's just to hold hold the cabbage in. Okay. Okay. So this is called a follower. And you can just use cabbage leaves. Some people also, um, with other kinds of kraut, use grape uh, leaves because they're lovely and big and they don't react adversely with the um, with the vegetable. Okay, so I've got lots of liquid there. Isn't that fantastic? Delicious. I'll wash my hands again. And the final, the final thing to do is to put a weight in. Just wondering what bag I'll use. Now, unfortunately, I do use these little plastic um, Ziploc bags because um, well, they're very convenient. I have used um, porcelain sort of, what have I got over here? Gorgeous little um, sort of plant holders that I bought in Taiwan. I have used those in a Ziploc bag as well, but you can use water. Um, so what you do is put some water in your Ziploc bag. And I'm never really very good at knowing how much I just sort of estimate it. It's probably, you know, sensible to pour the water in with the um, Ziploc bag inside the jar already. So make sure you get all the, the air out. And you pop it in and you can see already that it's the brine is rising up a little bit. I think I might put a little bit more water in there. And let me just get a little glass. We are on rain water here, so I'm happy to use from the tank. Not that it matters anyway. This is going inside the, the Ziploc. And in this case, it doesn't really matter if some of this water does escape. It'll just add to the brine. It doesn't make a huge difference. Okay, so I have, I'm happy with my weight. That's what it's called. It provides another level of protection. We can see that the brine is up there. This jar is definitely going to, to flow over because I probably have filled it a little too much. And the final step is to get um, the rubber thing uh, from the jar, put it around. These can get a bit manky after three or four uses, so um, it's always good to buy new new ones every now and then to use i would say this this will be the last time that i use this particular rubber and then you lock it up and hello hello coming back that that is your jar of sauerkraut that is already beginning to ferment the fact that we can see all that brine tells us that the good bacteria are already doing, doing their job. Now, where to keep it?
keep it somewhere dark so that it doesn't get much light because light is heat and you don't want too much heat. The ideal temperature is between 12 and 24 degrees. Um, so this is why I often don't make sauerkraut in the summer. I don't have any air conditioning in my house and it can get quite hot. Um, so I try to make all of my sauerkraut in, um, from autumn through to spring and then just have some to keep over summer. But if you do have um, a cool house or somewhere cool around, you can make sauerkraut all the way through the year. So somewhere dark, on a tray in case the brine spills over when the CO2 is released um, and uh, not too hot. Ferment it for about a month at least. That's my recommendation. Now, I fermented this one. I can't remember really. It's probably a good idea to make a note as well, maybe in some uh, texture on top of your jar. Um, I think I fermented this one a couple of months ago. It's totally fine. You can keep it out of the fridge for, you know, a month or two or three. But once you open it, you need to put it in the fridge. You can either put the sauerkraut into different jars and then make some more, some fresh sauerkraut in in the airlock jars, or you can keep it in the fridge in these. I find that you don't need the weight or the follower once in the fridge. It, it pretty much just stops the whole process, although it is working a little bit, but not enough to be worried by the fact that there isn't a follower and there isn't um, a weight. So that's how you make naked sauerkraut. Remember, it's good for you. It is delicious. I love it with, um, well, if you eat meat, it's great with something like sausages. It's great in salads. I often have it with a couple of chat potatoes. It's very simple. And I'm finding that the more I eat it, the more I want it. All right. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you have fun making sauerkraut.